excited. <laughs> I tell you what, I cannot wait fast. I can't. I can't get to January first fast enough. That's when I come on full time with GCI. I love this group of people. I, uh, I received. I received so much already this weekend, and I tell you what, there's no one in the whole ministry of GCI that I respect and admire more than my brother Tim Brazell right here. And he, he's one of the main reasons I wanted to come into this movement. This, this movement is, the, there are lots of wonderful people I've, that's been proven again and again. But Tim, thank you for welcoming me and for embracing me the way you have and for inviting me to this weekend. This has been incredible. I mean, from the very beginning, you know, when, when Tim just said, Hey, we're going to worship with Jesus this weekend. I thought, yes, yeah. yeah, not just to Jesus, but with Jesus. Yeah. Worshiping in us and for us yeah. and through us. And then when Donna was talking about grace alone, that's Christ alone. Yeah. When we talk about grace, yeah. we're talking about Jesus Christ. Thank you, Donna. I thought Joe's message was so profound about the idea of response and how it's, it's, it's the response of Jesus Christ for us that really makes judgment really a self-condemnation when we go against the grain of that. And there's an intrinsic consequence to not believing. But it's really a self-condemnation. God's not against us. I love uh, Hannah. Where's Hannah? That song you sang was incredible. I've been that's been resonating in my mind and heart since I heard it. So thank you for that. I'll be looking for you on one of those TV shows. <laughs> You've got the talent for sure. And then just hearing, hearing uh, Calvin talk about the fact that we want to steal that mediation back away from Christ. And if we could cut out the middle man, we would. That was a great line. We don't like the fact that Jesus Christ has done something for us because we didn't give him permission. <laughs> but we, we like to steal that back. And that's just part of our sinful bit. And then what Bill was talking about, about who we really are. It reminded me of that, uh, that old country preacher that said, be who you are, because if you ain't who you are, you are who you ain't. <laughs> That's not a good place to be. We know who we really are in Christ. I hated to miss. I got back for one dance, and I hated to miss the dinner last night. My son plays soccer in college a couple of hours from here, and he had a game yesterday afternoon, so I was able to take him out to dinner after the game. Really had a great time with him. And tell you what, you know how it is watching your children grow up. It just seems like yesterday that David was there in the, in the bed when I was tucking him in. And, and I'd leave the room and we had the little ritual we'd say to each other after praying. We'd, and and we'd, I'd say, hey, David, I love you and like you. And he'd say, love you and like you, Dad. And, you know, that's what it's all about this weekend, right? Why can we say that to our children and receive it from our children? It's because we really do have a Father who loves us and likes us. No matter what the Father has been like in our earthly experience, even the best Father pales in comparison to the Father we all have in Jesus Christ. And by the Holy Spirit, we hear those words and it changes us. That love of the Father. I want to tell you one thing real quick before I start my sermon today. So hopefully I'm not on the clock quite yet. But uh, on the intern program, you heard a couple words on Friday night. I just wanted to tell you how excited I am about what the intern program is providing for GCI, in my opinion, is bringing in lots of diversity. People who are excited about this message from all corners. In fact, five of the nine interns coming in this year are African American brothers and sisters. We, are, we have got diversity coming into the ranks. It's so exciting thanks to people like Calvin who turned us on to one of the interns and Tim and Calvin have been mentoring these people and they've been learning from Tim and Calvin on the website and on their blog and now they're at Duke Divinity School but they want to be GCI interns. They want to be with us and I hope they can join us next year at this conference. Wouldn't that be great? We'll get them right here. Now, Back to this idea, be who you are, not who you're not. It's the Holy Spirit who lifts us up to live in the reality of who we really are. Today's message is about, Tim asked me to preach on the Holy Spirit. 
the spirit of truth against the spirit of falsehood. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us to detect all the counterfeits of the spirits of falsehood that prey upon us. You see, the devil's strategy is dualism. And I'll explain what I mean by that. He even uses Holy Scripture to try to convince us that we're not good enough and that we're not included. He wants us to pick one or the other in this world to condemn ourselves. And what I mean by that is, that's what dualism is. It's a line that goes down the middle where you have to pick one or the other. And Bill talked about that a little bit yesterday. But what I mean is, in this world, we don't always experience, the devil uses this kind of ammunition against us because we have a tendency to think of ourselves as either one tree or the other as the Gospels tell us. Remember when Jesus said a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit? Well, when we bear bad fruit, the devil says, well, that means that's because you're a bad tree. That's what he does. He uses the dualism because he uses Jesus' own words against us. The good tree bears good fruit and the bad tree bears bad fruit. There's a line right down the middle. That's what we call dualism. And Satan uses that against us. 1 John is the antidote against that kind of deception. Because basically what 1 John does is spins all the devil's bullets for him. So he doesn't have anything left in the end. And we can actually understand what 1 John means when we get past the dualism to describe what we call a duality. The duality is has to do with the fact that that in, the, that in the first Adam, we have a past, sinful, fallen self. And this is how we're made up. Like you could say in Romans 5, we see our first Adam and our second Adam. But we experience both of those in the present tense, don't we? This is the world that we live in right now. And that seems like a duality in the sense that we have to be either one or the other. But Romans 5 tells us that this is a universal, this is not a dualism. It's, not, it's a duality. It's a universal experience that we both experience the first Adam and the second Adam in this world. The devil wants us to say, well, because I experience sin and because I sin, I must be this one up here. But that's really our past. It's been done away with. Like it says in Romans 6, this is really who we are. Our, we have been crucified with Christ that the body of sin might be done away with. So we are no longer slaves to sin. That's been done. This is the present future of our existence. But we do live in this overlap. And that's what Romans 7 is about, this overlap, because Paul talks about being a slave to God and a slave to sin. And we do experience that in this world, right? In this present tense, in this present place, we experience both of these things. But in Christ, we know that this is who we really are. And so in a sense, there's a big, bold line here. Whereby we know sin does not have a future. And that the future that we do have visits us in the present. And convinces us that that's who we really are. And that is the role of the Holy Spirit. He reveals to us who we really are. He gives us the future in the present. And 1 John is telling us, don't be persuaded by the devil's tricks to make you think that just because you experience this in the present, that this is who you really are. That is not the case. But what 1 John does is makes us realize that both of these things are happening in the present tense and then allows the Holy Spirit to interpret them. But he, the Holy Spirit is not afraid to show us that yes, we do sin. 1 John can be very confusing <laughs> um, because it seems to be saying things that uh, are directly contradictory. You know, growing up in the sports world, 
I, uh, you have a lot of rivalries, right? And there's like, if you're one of these, you cannot be the other. You know, if you're a Duke fan, you can't be a Carolina fan. There is no way. No way in the world. <laughs> when my son, when we first moved to Durham, when we first moved to Durham, we went up to someone's house as a family who had invited us over, and my son had a Carolina shirt on. And we were walking in the door, all happy to see the folks, and the man at the door said, son, you have to stay right there. And kind of started closing the door. We don't allow that kind of shirt in this house. And he was only four or five years old. He didn't know how to take that. He was like, what? You know, everybody jokes with each other about that kind of thing in Durham and Chapel Hill. However, just because we think of it that way as something that's mutually exclusive, um, that's not always the way when it comes to sin and righteousness that we experience it. Now, let me give you an example out of 1 John since Tim asked us to go to this text and how confusing this can be. And I want to try to clarify it. In 1 John 3, we have heard, we hear, those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin because they've been born of God. We know that those who are born of God, it says in chapter 5, do not sin. Now, how can the devil use that? Well, again, same logic. If I do sin, what does that mean? According to, we just use that kind of reverse logic. If I do sin, what does that mean? I'm not born of God. See how the devil gets in our head? So what does this mean? Because just down here a few verses later, or actually a few verses before in chapter 1, <laughs> it says the opposite. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So which one is it, Dad, huh? yeah. You know what I mean? I've been saying that if I, if I sin, you know, I've not been born of God. And it says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. What gives here? The devil uses this stuff. I'll tell you, he can even use 1 John against us to get us to think we're the bad tree because we have bad fruit once in a while, or maybe more often than we would like. Now, some, trans Trump said, some translations try to gloss this over. They say in, verse, in, chapter, you know, in these first verses that I read, those who have been born of God do not continue to sin. That softens it up a little bit, doesn't it? They do not continue to sin. Well, what does that mean? Continue to sin like... Well, it means you don't have a pattern of sinful behavior. But what is a pattern of sinful behavior? That's very arbitrary, isn't it? Like, does that mean, you know, lusting over pornography once a week? Is that a pattern? Or once a month? Or once a year? I mean, what's a pattern? There's no way to know. So the devil gets in our head about that. To try to convince us that we're not born of God. It's kind of like... This, polar, this polarity in First John, there's lots of polarities. That means the opposites we're talking about, the dualism. You've got light and you've got darkness. There is no party between light and darkness. There is a de definite, bold line. In fact, they are movements of light and movements of darkness going against each other at 180 degrees, Karl Barth tells us. I think that's exactly right. There's actually a counterfeit ontology that wants to tell us that we are this person and it goes against the counterfeit ontology of righteousness. Now, with those two things in mind, we have to move past this arbitrary type of self-judgment which leads to self-condemnation. We have to move past this, but how do we do it? What does this all mean? Because we know that flesh gives birth to flesh and spirit gives birth to spirit. And the devil wants us to say, well, Based on my behavior, I must be, I must be uh, not a Christian, not born of God, not adopted, not loved by the Father at all. Now, what 1 John is teaching us is that instead of a dualism where we're one tree or the other, there's actually a duality going on. And that means we have two dimensions about us. Scripture calls that the old man and the new man, even though that's sexist language. We're the old person, we're the new person. We're the old self, we're the fault, we're the new self. Karl Barth says it this way. He is, 
The Christian is always the old man totally and all together from top to toe. Just as in the same present of the divine pardon, he is always the new man totally and all together from top to toe. The man who goes forward to the goal of his righteousness, who has indeed already arrived, who is alive there as a righteous man. That's what we're talking about, about the present. In the present, we experience the old man and the new man. Even though we know the old has died ultimately, in our experience, we experience it as both being present. So they're both in the present tense, you could say, but not in the same sense. There's a preponderance, a weight to the present future, which trumps the past present. Karl Marx says this, this is interesting too, because we often talk to, uh, like to categorize ourselves as better than other people, like, well, we in the church or we Christians are better than, Karl Marx says, the men outside the church are no different from those inside within the community. The saints are not, as it were, children unfortunately led astray by wicked rascals. They themselves are wicked rascals. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ justified one kind of person, the wicked. Thank God for the justification of the wicked. But our wickedness is still with us in the present. But it's the Holy Spirit that interprets our lives so that we do not get caught up into defining ourselves the wrong way. Now, why do we talk about all this? Why do we talk about the flesh? We've moved past this. Come on. I mean, we, we don't need to talk, go back and talk about all that. No. That's exactly what the, the uh, devil wants us to do. It's knowing the present future as an anchor to our existence that allows us to go back and talk about sin in a healthy way. Because we can see it doesn't belong. It's a parasite. It, it, it's, it's just... it's. It's sucking on the truth, trying to take it its own life, a life of its own, but it really can't. We need to go back and talk about sin, number one, for three reasons. Number one, it protects us against an over-realized eschatology where we are just oblivious to sin and the consequences and the damaging things that it can do and how dangerous things like racism are in this world. And we don't want to lose touch with the fact that Jesus Christ has justified the wicked, but we need to know what he's justified us from if we want to be able to be most healthy in terms of our life in this world. Secondly, we need to know about this heinous mess of sin so that we can be assured that it won't win. You see? Karl Marx said it this way. He said, you know, I thought that old man had drowned, but I found out he's a pretty good swimmer. <laughs> you know, think about it. Think about it. If we think we're past all, oh, the old is gone, the new has come, and then all of a sudden, old man rears his ugly head, we're surprised, and then all of a sudden we think, oh gosh, it must not have worked. No, this is natural in the human life. It's natural, but we need to interpret it. But we need to go ahead and give it its full weight so that nothing can surprise us and, and try to knock us off of where we are as we stand in Jesus Christ. It can't do that, but in our minds sometimes we allow that because we underestimate just how powerful sin is and how powerful the old man is. And so what we do as Christians is when these times arise, when sin rears its ugly head, we try to suppress it. Ever played that game at the arcade where you have a mallet and you try to hit all the things as they pop up? It's like we're doing that all the time. We're going to knock them down and you know, keep them down under the surface. That doesn't work. In fact, and psychology tells us this, which is a very spiritual truth, the more we suppress it, the more power we give. Let's let the devil say all he wants to say about our old false self. I know that's not who I really am anyway. Let's go ahead and entertain all the bad things that I can do as a person, that society does to me, that I do to society. Give it its full weight. It still can't outweigh this. And that allows me then to be able to address it. And that's what 1 John is doing. It's given it's the devil... Uh, given the old man the sense the, that, that kind of serious consideration, spending all the bullets the devil wants to shoot till he has nothing left and we're even more assured than ever. So, we don't want to just interpret our sin gradually like with more and more or less and less. No, it's total sin and it's total righteousness, but we know which total is the winner. And we know who we are 
in Christ. And it's not just sequential. The sequence is really Jesus Christ's. When we start looking for sequence in our life, well, that was the moment where I changed and the old was gone. Or that was the moment. No, it was when I was recommitted this time. No, that's when the old was gone and the new was gone. We keep looking for sequence in our life. The sequence is Jesus Christ. That's where our anchor is on this chart. Not in our own analysis. What theologians call psychologism. When we're trying to figure out and analyze ourselves to talk us into the fact that we really are a child of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who does this. So now, putting this all back together. The one verse says, he does not sin. A person born of God does not sin. Well, that's true. A person born of God does not sin. He's totally righteous. There's no sin in you at all, in your new self, in Jesus Christ, who you really are. You don't sin. But your existence is overlapped by the false self. And he can do nothing but sin. So the product is always going to be mixed. But how do we interpret it? By the Holy Spirit, we interpret it to know who we really are and which one of ourselves doesn't fit and doesn't go on. And therefore, we bring the present by the Spirit into the future to inform our lives and to encourage us in the life of sanctification. This is what John says in 1 John in the beginning. He says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What he's saying there is, because of what we're talking about today, confession, confession is really great. It's, it's important. Confessing to God, but also a transparency with each other. We don't have to hide these sins, but thinking that if I tell them about that, they'll think I'm not born of God. I can't tell them about that and they'll think I'm not a Christian. I, I, I can't be transparent because... Well, that's the devil's workshop, isn't it? It's exactly what I'm telling you. He wants to convince you by your bad fruit that you're a bad tree. That's exactly what this is all about. And First John is saying, no, confess those things, and you will experience the love and forgiveness of Christ afresh. It doesn't mean if you confess, you'll be forgiven. But because you're forgiven, confess. Before, but in fact, if you don't know you're forgiven before you confess, you miss it. You're not, you're not really confessing at all. You're confessing to the wrong God who you're trying to talk into liking you. No. Unless you know that you're forgiven, you then can confess freely. You can let all the doors open. You can talk, confide in a brother or in your spouse, and you can tell them everything. And it diffuses the power of Satan who wants us to focus on sin management, and he just gets us in his grasp when we do that. He wants, anytime we use that suppression game, he loves it. Because it's like a, it's like one of those things called like a hydra. You chop off the head and it just keeps coming back at you more and more. That's what we do when we focus on sin. We don't focus on sin. We focus on Jesus Christ and what he's done. And therefore, we interpret sin. That's what First John is all about. I have a good friend of mine who is a counselor. And she has, she told me about this experience. She calls it her 80-20 rule. She goes, you know, when somebody, she gets, this is a personal experience. She said, I have a boy, I had a boyfriend. He came up to me after cheating on me. I knew he had. And he, and he was just crying. He was just beside himself. I'm so sorry. I, I, uh, I did this and I did this. And, and she said, well, what's the other 20%? <laughs> in other words, she said your confession is always about 80% when you're not in a safe place. Just to get people off your back. But then there's always that other 20% that you're not going to say. So this boyfriend came to her and said, oh, I did this, I did this, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. She just looked at him and said, well, what's the other 20%? <laughs> That's, we don't have to worry about that when it comes to Jesus Christ. The, the, in Jesus Christ, we can confess 100%. We don't have to manage that thinking that he's going to change his attitude about us if we um, give him everything that we have thought about and everything that we have done and all of our hurts as well. Now, just to finish, so maybe we can interpret John chap 1 John chapter 3 a lot differently now. My hope is that you will be able to do this. Just a few verses out of John chapter 3. We started out, see what the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Beloved, 
We are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. Remember Bill's message yesterday about we already are this, but it hasn't been fully revealed. When we get fully revealed, that top line on that chart just disappears. This contradiction doesn't chase us into the future. Now, knowing that this is the who we really are, that we are really pure, that we really do not sin in Christ, listen to this. Little children, let no one deceive you. This is verse 7. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Now, does that verse... Are you thinking a little differently with me about that verse now? After what we've talked about? This would scare me spitless if I did not know the big picture. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. You see, with this picture, he said, yeah, in my sinful self, I'm a child of the devil. I hate that. But I can say that. Spend all the devil's bullets. I don't care. Let him do whatever he wants to. In my old, false, corrupt, depraved self, I'm a child of the devil. I can, I'm can. i free to say that before you guys because I know the bigger truth. I'm free to confess 100% of who I am not because I know who I am. I don't have to worry about the devil's games trying to commit, convince me that because of bad fruit I'm a bad tree. 1 John allows us to interpret all the parables in a new light. Here's another verse, verse 15. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life. <laughs> what are you doing that? Can you see what I'm saying? How beautiful this is? How judgment is a good thing? Murderers do not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus said if you hate somebody one time, you've murdered them. Well, the devil then uses his tricks. Well, that means you're not going to heaven because you hate somebody one time because murderers don't enter the kingdom of heaven. No, I'm thankful that my murderous self who has hated somebody doesn't enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm thankful that that door has been shut on me and, and Jesus says, you're not coming in this house. I'm thankful that I am that person who gets to walk in boldly into the house and before the throne of grace because of who I am in Jesus Christ because in him I'm not a murderer. Do you see how this makes sense? Whenever our hearts condemn us, notice he says whenever. <laughs> See how our hearts are going to condemn us because Satan gets in our ears. Whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. He knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God. We receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we believe in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ, his son, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us. How? By the spirit that he has given us. So no, this is not a tug of war. Even though in this present tense, who will rescue me from the body of this body of sin? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.